So um, one of the uh, weird things about me is I actually don't, um, I, it's pretty rarely that I cry out of sadness. I generally get teary-eyed when uh, out of inspiration, and I remember uh, definitely crying the first time I saw that. Um, and I was actually, uh, uh, that was actually not filmed at this year's Life is Beautiful, but the previous year. And was and, if, and actually, I think if you want to catch the rest of the the episode or see our actual talk, that's available online. But I actually had not uh, had had missed her talk in 2015, so um, thought so watched the video, um, but thought even better, why not bring her to Zappos? So please welcome Claire. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Is this working? Yes? Can you hear me? I have like this constant reoccurring nightmare. I don't have very many nightmares. But the one that I do have is that my mic isn't on. And then I get up on stage and I do the best talk I've ever done in my entire life and no one can hear me. And then no one gives me any feedback afterwards and I'm like, oh my God, it must have been horrible. And then it just turns out my mic wasn't on. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, this is exciting. Um, so a few things before the actual talk. One, I have fully decided that next time I do a talk, I'm gonna get a jumper it's going to have ruffles, and I'm going to steal his sweet sequin jacket <laughs> because that looks so cool on stage. Like my peasant dress, where it looks like I'm supposed to be like milking a cow, does not compare in the slightest to the sequin jacket. Uh, so, you know, just heads up anyone in case anyone wants to buy me a sequin jacket. Um, and then the second thing is I'm so incredibly honored to be here. Um, and to be speaking for you guys, it's amazing because it was a whole year ago that I did that talk. Um, and so it's, it's so cool how things come full circle like this, and it's an honor, and thank you for having me and for hearing me. Um, even though I had no, you guys had no idea I was even going to be here, so thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, as, it, as the video so stated, my name is Claire Wineland. I'm 19 years old now, and I have always... Another year down! <laughs> um, hopefully another to go. We'll see. Um, but I have always had a strong relationship with death and with dying. When I was born, my life expectancy was 10 years old. And then it moved to 13, then it moved to 16, and then 19, and now it's in 20s somewhere. Who knows, maybe 25. I'm hoping we get past 21. Like, I just wanna, I just wanna go clubbing once. Like, that's it. I don't ask for much in life. Um, sorry, mom, if you're watching this. Uh, uh, so my death has always been a huge part of my life and something I've always had to deal with. And that's because I have cystic fibrosis. CF is a genetic disease, meaning I was born with it, and it causes an overload of mucus to accumulate in the body. So it's like thick, sticky tar. It builds up in your lungs and your sinuses and your pancreas, and it causes a whole host of issues, some of them being organ malfunction, long hospital stays. I've spent around a quarter of my life in the hospital, 50 somewhat medications, four hours of breathing treatments a day, Countless surgeries, I mean like 35 at this point. And the biggest thing is that it's progressive. So as I get older, CF gets worse. And it gets harder and harder to do what you need to do to stay alive. And I'm not telling you any of this to depress you or to bring down the mood or to make you feel sorry for me. I'm saying this to prove a point. And the point is that I have lived a life of a lot of pain and I'm not pretending that I haven't. I've had to deal with death, I've had to deal with painful surgeries, I've had to deal with being alone and scared in the hospital. But I have had a beautiful life, and one that I'm so incredibly proud of, and that is not in spite of having CF. That's because of it. So how is that possible? 
What is it about the way that we view society, the way that society views illness, where it tells us that someone who's sick can't live a beautiful, full, rich life? Why do we have that notion? Because for me, I was raised, I mean, ever since the time I could walk and crawl and draw and, and communicate with people, I was living my dream and having fun and being a kid. And everyone I ever met in my entire life would come up to me and say, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you're sick. You know, they get down, you know how people do. They get down on like on kids' levels. I'm so sorry. Um, and I remember thinking, I mean, it, is this person really happy? Is that what happiness looks like? So I'm gonna start with a story. Um, when I was around, let's say seven, I always, I guesstimate here because like, you know, everything under 10 is a blur. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna say seven. Um, and I was in the hospital and I was scared and I was alone and I was flipping through an HGTV Home and Gardens catalog as a seven-year-old does uh, because I was obsessed with HGTV and I still am. Um, I'd watch all those like, you know, those like under $10 or under $100 like home makeovers. That was the coolest thing ever. Um, and so there I was in my hospital room and I was feeling so separate from the world, so separate from humanity. I felt like I was in this bubble, like I could never live a normal life, I could never be part of humanity. And so flipping through this catalog, and there's a picture of this gorgeous New York loft apartment, right, with the big windows and the, and the you know, the day bed and the sheepskin on the floor and the whole shebang, and I'm thinking, I want to be there. That's the kind of life that I want for myself. But I couldn't, I was in a hospital room, and I was sick. But I looked around the room, and I realized, hey, I got four walls, I got a window, I got a bed, I have a bedside table, why don't I try and decorate this? Why don't I try to make this feel like home? So, uh, I called up my parents, and I asked them to go shopping for me at Target, uh, because I didn't have any money, I was seven. And uh, <laughs> so, so they got me twinkle lights, and throw pillows, and sheepskins, and whatever I wanted, because they're great parents. Thanks, Mom. Um, and, I, and I decked out my hospital room. And I don't mean just a little bit. I mean, like, I had IVs in my arm, tubes on my face, like, my heart rate going crazy, and I was, like, pushing the bed up against the wall, and, like, dragging the chair and making a day bed. And once it was done, people from all over the hospital came to see it. Like the doctors, the nurses, Peter from Interventional Radiology, like everybody came to come and to see the hospital room because it was different, it felt like home. And there was a tiny part of my brain that wondered while that was going on after I had made this room feel so special and great, I wondered why isn't this normal? Why don't we do this to all of our hospital rooms? So then years went on, and I kept decorating rooms, kept being a total freak, and then 13 came along. And as you all sadly saw with the sad music, um, two days after my 13th birthday, I went into a routine surgery, and I got a blood infection. And it attacked the weakest part of my body, which was my lungs. So I went into full-on lung failure. And I was on a ventilator, and that didn't work. Which, think about if any of you, which I know some of you had to, at least the girls, ever watch Grey's Anatomy, or ER, or House, you know ventilators are like, ventilator is the thing that keeps you breathing when you're on your deathbed, and that didn't work for me. So they had to put me on something called an oscillator. And no one with cystic fibrosis had ever been on an oscillator and come off alive. So when I went on that, the doctors had to tell my parents, she has a 1% chance of surviving. And through that whole experience, people from my entire life, everyone my family and parents had ever known, came out to support them, to give, bring snacks and wet wipes and those weird little dry toothbrush thingies that you can use where you just pop the toothpaste, um, and to help them you know, pay for the rent and their bills while they couldn't be at work because they had to be with me. So when I came out of the coma, which I obviously did, I'm sadly not a ghost talking to you right now. Um, <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> um, when I came out of the coma, in the months that I was recovering, I couldn't even pick up a fork, I couldn't hold a spoon, I couldn't walk 35 feet. It was some of the most painful and hard time of my entire life. And yet, through that experience, I realized other CF families don't have the support that we had. 
They don't have people to lean on when they're going through that experience. And what I went through is not any different from what other CF kids have to go through and what other CF families have to go through. So I thought, hey, maybe there's something we can do about this. And that's how the Claire's Place Foundation was started. So the Claire's Place Foundation gives grants to families whose kids are sick in the hospital with CF. So we pay for their rent, their car payments, their medical bills, their machinery bills, whatever they need, so that they can be there with their kids when they're sick, so they can give them the support that I had. So flash forward another six years, and all of a sudden, the foundation had thrown me into this insane teenage life where I was able to, to travel and do public speaking and be an advocate and help people in a way that I never dreamed, that little seven-year-old me never imagined. And something slowly started to click. It started to make sense what my entire life was about and what it meant. Because here's the thing. Go back to that hospital room. The reason that no one decorates their hospital room, the reason that's not a thing, is because we are told from the time we're a kid to the time we're, you know, to the time of our death, that all that matters is our health. Think about it, when you're sick, all you're told is that, yeah, just wait till you're healthy, and then you can live your life. Like, let's get you healthy so that you can do what you wanna do with your life. What happens when you're never gonna be healthy? What happens when you're always gonna be sick, when all you have is that hospital room, when you're never gonna have a New York loft apartment? What do you do? Because the truth is, that hospital room, what do we think of when we think of hospital rooms? We think of cold, we think of white, we think of sterile, we think of where people go to die, right? We think of like little ju 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 purr, purr. we think of that. <laughs> what if the hospital is just a room what if it is just four walls and a window and a bed? And it is up to us to choose what we do with it. Because I was not given a New York loft apartment. I was not given possibility to get whatever house I want. I had a hospital room. And I figured out how to make it home. And that's because I didn't reject it. I didn't try and run away from the suffering and the pain because the truth is we all feel it. We all have our hospital room, whatever it is. We all have the place that we're scared of, the loneliness and the pain. It's part of being a human being. But the beautiful part of being a human being is we have the opportunity to take that, to look at that, and to make it what we want it to be. We can lay out everything we've ever felt, everything we've experienced, and make something with it. And as a whole society, the way that we view people who are sick, the way that we view people who are suffering is so backwards because we tell them they have to wait until they're healthy. They have to wait until they're better off to live the life that they're proud of instead of teaching them from the moment they're born how to make their lives what they want it to be. And with the foundation, with the past six years of my life, with all of that, I've been able to touch people and help people and give back to people, not because I'm some great person, but because I was able to make something I was proud of with my life. Because I didn't let CF become something that bogged me down. And the thing is, I'm not fully a motivational speaker. I don't know if you guys have like caught on to that by now. <laughs> and I'm not always, I'm not also not like an informational speaker either. But here's one thing, a lot of motivational speakers will tell you, the point of life is to be happy, right? The point of life is just to be happy, to do what makes you happy. I think that's bullshit. I think the happiness is an emotion, right? Happiness is some dopamine firing in your brain, and it's great and it's awesome when it happens. We can't chase happiness. We have to chase deep satisfaction and pride, and there's a difference. And the way that we do that is not by running away from our pain, it's not by running away from my sickness, because I'm never gonna be healthy. This is what I have. I'm always gonna be sick. But yet I can say, so what? I still have a life. I can still make whatever I want with it. Life is complex and it's a, it's a wide roller coasters of emotions and experiences and all of us are gonna feel at the bottom of our barrel. All of us are gonna go through suffering. The entire world feels pain sometimes. But what's beautiful is that that is the complexity we're chasing. We can't run away from suffering to find happiness, and we don't run away from happiness to find suffering. <clears throat> they are both there in our lives. 
I can be sick and yet I can travel the world and be a speaker and do whatever I want. You can be in pain and yet you can see beauty and that's what makes life so incredible. So we all get to look at our hospital rooms, we all get to look at the places in our lives that we're not proud of, the places in our lives we wanna run from and reject and just wait till we get healthy, wait till we get better, wait till we get richer. We can look at that, we can accept it, we can take pride in it. Take pride in our experience. I'm so proud of what I've learned. I'm proud that I was never allowed to run away from dying. I was never allowed to run away from the fear of death. I can accept that, I can take pride in that, and we can do something with it. And that's the joy of being alive and the joy of being human. Thank you. <laughs>